it's a great pleasure. Really, it is. Uh, it always is, but it's even more today because I've known Don Rowley for so long. Uh, I met him as a graduate student years ago. I forced him to go to the gym with me, which wasn't so pleasant for him at that time. Uh, and our relationship was largely based on the fact that we were both interested in the Russian Revolution and Civil War and in local studies. So I had done a book on Baku, and he read that thanks to Alex Rabinowitz. Uh, and then he did one, the, really the first local study uh, ever done on the Russian Revolution in a Russian city in the city of Saratov on the Volga. That turned into two volumes. The second volume was done once the archives opened and is really a much bigger book than you'd think by even the title. Uh, it, it's a book about the whole uh, civil war in the Volga and one of the major studies of that event. He is now the J. Richard Judson Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And Don has gone on to write a number of other works, uh, both monographic studies, edited the Soviet Studies in History Journal for a long time, uh, introduced many of us in the West to Burjalov, one of the great sort of uh, ic uh, iconoclastic historians of the Soviet period who wrote on the revolution. And then some years ago, he turned to, and many of us start writing about ourselves, you know, as we get older and older, except Val is writing on witches. Um, <laughs> but they, uh, Don began to write about his own generation, the generation born in, can I say, 1949? Uh, he's as young as he looks, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union, and doing a comparative study between Saratov graduates there and graduates in, in uh, Moscow. And he wrote a book, which is one that is very useful for teaching courses on Russia's Sputnik generation. And he- You're gonna get, see some visuals, which you didn't get to, to see last night. Well, I began by talking, uh, by mentioning that there, there's a story behind the making uh, of each book. Uh, and I wanna tell you a little bit about mine. Uh, until recently, my office on the fourth floor of Hamilton Hall at the University of North Carolina was the only one occupied, uh, not occupied by someone affiliated with a Carolina's uh, distinguished Southern Oral History Program. And I must have walked past uh, these offices with all the promotional literature and posters, uh, you know, back and forth to, the, to go to class, to the department, the bathroom, to get coffee uh, over the years, uh, probably thousands of times, uh, noticing all this you know, information about oral history. And I was just finishing up a book on the Russian Civil War uh, that involved 12 years of annual research trips to Saratov on the Volga, uh, a book that took an awful lot out of me. I was dealing with voluminous archival material. Uh, and uh, it was a difficult book to finish, and I was itching to tackle something altogether new and different. Uh, but I didn't want to give up my relationship with Saratov that I had sort of like the Stockholm Syndrome, you're taken hostage by someone and after a while you start identifying with them. And that's sort of how I felt with Saratov. Well, one day the inspiration came, duh, why don't I do oral history? Uh, back then I could count on one hand the number of oral histories in the Russian field. Uh, and, but I had never read any of them, uh, truth be told. Uh, so what would I write about? Well, the answer uh, to my question came when I was attending the graduation uh, from Knox College, which is my alma mater, of uh, magna cum laude graduate Anna Abratsova, whose parents and Moscow family I've known since 1976. Uh, over the years, uh, uh, Anna's mother, my friend Luba, uh, shared many stories of attending one of Moscow's most prestigious schools, uh, special school uh, number 20, special school number 20, which offered intensive instruction um, in English. Uh, and it was while we were driving to, uh, driving to Galesburg, Illinois to, <laughs> to pick up, um, to go to that honors graduation that it occurred to me, Lube, why don't I write about your graduation class? And when I realized that Saratov also had a, a, a graduating class, the class of 1967, I knew I had a topic uh, and one that I liked very much. Well, through the life stories of the USSR's uh, Cold War generation, uh, Soviet baby boomers traces the transformative developments of the second half of the 20th century that brought down the Soviet empire. The individuals I engaged graduated uh, in 1967 from Moscow's school number 20, 
or from Saratov School number 42, so-called what we would call magnet schools today that once again offered in intensive instruction in English. Although most of the members of this cohort still live in Moscow or Saratov, others have immigrated to the United States, Canada, Western Europe, and Western Europe, and a number of them are, are dead. Members of the generation that began school, the USSR, lifted the first artificial uh, satellite, uh, Sputnik, into space in 1957. They came of age at the zenith of Soviet socialism, uh, only to see the system crumble some three decades uh, later. We have yet to fully understand why this remarkable uh, transformation occurred, but ironically, uh, much of it had to do with the Soviet system's very success at affecting social change whose byproducts included rapid industrialization and a concomitant rise in the number of educated professionals, which, by the way, include uh, all the members of the cohort uh, I examined. Um, universal college admission acceptance, except for one person among those I interviewed, so it's very, very um, striking. I want to remind you that uh, we do have landmark studies on Soviet public opinion available, which show that between uh, 1940 and 1980, uh, a remarkable uh, reversal took place in regard to the relationship of one's age and level of support for the Soviet system. On the eve of World War II, it was the younger generation uh, in the USSR that voiced the greatest enthusiasm for, uh, for the Soviet system. But by 1980, uh, when the baby boomers turned 30, uh, the higher the educational level achieved by the younger generation, the weaker their backing was for the regime itself, with the exception that support for the, uh, the uh, system increased overall based on one's income. So if you were doing very well financially in the Soviet Union, chances were more likely that you were supporting the system. Well, why this, uh, why this particular uh, cohort? Um, the Soviet government announced a return to normality in 1948. You recall that there was famine in 1946, 1947. It took several years to demobilize the Red Army. Uh, and in 1948, the government announced, you know, again, normality had been achieved. And we do see uh, a spike in the birth rate beginning in 1949. Well, uh, I was born in 1949, too, so I thought, oh, my age cohort, my, my generation. Uh, moreover, in looking at these two groups of people, I, I'm dealing with the manageable size of people. There are 135 graduates uh, total from the two schools. So I had 135 potential informants I could try to track down, uh, not knowing at that point, of course, how many of them might have died. And about 10, 10 of those actually had, had died by the time I began the project. Uh, its members are well-educated, uh, they're articulate, uh, and they remain sort of loosely networked, uh, particularly the Saratov group. Uh, and besides, a good number of them uh, emigrated, uh, which allows me in the book to discuss the whole uh, diaspora issue uh, as well. Now, the fact that they attended English language schools also was sort of uh, a consideration for me because the very appearance of these schools, I think, symbolized the country's a cautious opening to the outside world uh, amid the changing battlefields of the Cold War and amid a uh, domestic climate uh, of heady optimism uh, in the 1950s. And I, I do have, as I mentioned, a personal uh, affinity uh, toward my informants. Um, again, by being the same age, I think it made it easier for me to see myself among others, um, knowing what stage I was in in my own life journey. Now, there's virtually unanimous uh, agreement, I think, that the Cold War generation worldwide uh, played a pivotal, a vital role, even defining role, in transforming uh, the climate of the contemporary world. By no means homogeneous, uh, the individuals I interviewed undoubtedly had very different expectations and very different life experiences uh, than less educated, less well-connected, and or rural elements of Soviet society. But I'd argue they're a very highly significant, critical component of the country's urban professional class. In some ways, inseparable from the entire Soviet mass intelligentsia, whose size grew exponentially in the decades following Stalin's death. In fact, statistically, between 1965 and 1982, 
There were 12 million Soviet citizens that graduated from uh, college at this time, including, as I mentioned, virtually uh, all of those uh, whom I interviewed. In that regard, uh, I'd suggest that the 1967 graduates uh, collect this story, tells the much larger story of the upper strata of the entire Cold War generation that lived through the USSR's twilight years. And again, the overarching purpose of the book is to look at what it meant and what it means for them, uh, for a Russian my age, uh, to have grown up in the, during the Cold War. That, uh. Now, why oral history? Well, equally important, uh, I mean, my book is one of the first on the post-1945 um, post Soviet history to draw on the uh, methodology uh, of oral history. The approach appealed to me. I, I told you in part why I came to the topic, but it appealed to me because in the Soviet Union, I'd argue, ideology in many regards was meant to replace memory. During and after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, Russian citizens began openly talking about their past, trying to make sense of it, and I saw obvious benefits in listening in. As Russian historian Daria Hubova said, I think so poignantly, it is sometimes said and is almost true that for us the documents are subjective and the only things which might be objective are the memories. It is sometimes said and almost true. This sort of reminds me of the turn in Holocaust studies, you know, Jan Gross's suggestion that we take the uh, uh, testimonials of the survivors at face value until we have other evidence. Now, I located and interviewed uh, uh, 60, uh, uh, in telling the story uh, of the cross-section of the country's baby boomers in their own words, I throw light on a critical generation of people who remain largely faceless and ignored uh, up until this time. Focusing on how a group of individuals born in 1949 and 1950 remembered their lives, I explore the margins among the political, the personal, and the professional. I seek in the book, among other things, to answer five uh, broadly gauged questions in order to grasp what it meant to, quote unquote, live Soviet during the Cold War. First, who and what uh, shaped the Cold War generation's worldviews while they were growing up? This is a picture from the Saratov School, from a uh, uh, second grade <coughs> picture. And by the way, um, in the course of the interviewing, I collected well over 400 photographs, and I hope to include about 50 of them uh, in the book. Uh, secondly, uh, what do their life stories tell us about what constituted the Soviet dream? Uh, and about the relationship between the growing emphasis on private life, the undermining of Marxist ideology, uh, and the fate uh, of the USSR. By the way, uh, I interviewed the person on the, your left. <laughs> uh, and uh, he was uh, someone I, the last person I found, I interviewed him in 2008, so that was my most recent uh, interview. Third, how have they negotiated the uh, challenging transition to a post-Soviet Russia following the collapse of, the, of communism uh, in 1991? Uh, and fourth, how have their lived experiences both uh, reproduced and transformed society? Uh, in other words, how do their personal stories help us comprehend uh, cultural transmission across generations? By the way, the, the teacher in the middle is one of my baby boomers, and she now lives on Cyprus. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, how do the memories of those who grew up in Moscow differ from those uh, raised in Saratov? Uh, this is a um, graduation night in Saratov, um, and uh, most of the young women made their own, uh, made their own dresses. From, you know, they took a home economics class, and one of them later told me that those skills came in very handy during Perestroika. She was a college professor, but she did some sewing on the side temporarily <coughs> uh, to make ends meet. Well, I located and interviewed uh, a total of 60 baby boomers between 2001 and 2008. 
Uh, working without assistance, I interviewed my subjects at their homes, at their dachas, at work, in apartments I rented, in hotel rooms, bed bug infested too in New York, uh, parks, uh, cafes, and in a parked car. I've taped them in Moscow, in Saratov, in New York, in Montreal, in Portland, in Ames, Iowa. And I conducted two interviews over the phone, one with someone in Israel and one with someone on Cyprus. Now, in both cases, I called those people several times beforehand, so we developed sort of a relationship, a uh, telephone relationship, before I did the interviewing. In all, I interviewed 31 members of the Saratov cohort, which was just slightly over 50 percent, and 29 members of the Moscow cohort, which is about 36 percent. Conducted in Russian, the interviews range in length from one to three hours. And although I employed open-ended interview techniques to uncover my informants' uh, remembered experiences, I formulated questions aimed at illuminating those five themes I had already uh, mentioned, those five questions. I made the conversations dialogic as much as po possible by asking my informants what they thought I needed to know about them in order to shed light on those questions that, I, that interested me most. I used their real names in the book, except in seven cases when they asked me to, re when they either asked to, re to remain anonymous or else they had me use just their first names. I do so not only because this is one of the conventions that distinguishes oral history from ethnography, but also, and I think this is important symbolically, most of the baby boomers are not afraid to reveal their identities. That in itself is a huge point here. Now, the oral history as a methodology, when I began the project, I knew nothing about it, and I had to start from scratch. And I, I went and asked people, well, what should I read? I went to our Southern oral history uh, specialist, and it was interesting reading about how the field had, uh, had changed between the 1980s when it had sort of uh, become, uh, um, gotten established in American uh, universities and the time I began my project at the start of the new millennium. Uh, earlier, it had been uh, under the influence of the social sciences, particular sociology, and there was a widespread belief that if the researcher was able to purge the interview of bias, one could reach the so-called truth. Uh, the big question, in other words, was one of quote unquote reliability. How reliable is your oral evidence? And I remember I was, when I was beginning the project and I was on leave at our Institute for Arts and Humanities and I took uh, two of the interviews and translated about 10 pages to give to my colleagues so we could have something to discuss. And someone had been in Berlin when the wall came down and he gave, he mentioned the wrong day by a day. And I had a colleague in the German department who was working on a bibliography of Hermann Hesse odd project. And he said, see, that's wrong. This is useless. It's not reliable. Well, fortunately, uh, since the 1980s, uh, under the influence of the European school, particularly uh, some remarkable oral histories coming out of Italy, uh, and the influence of sister disciplines, there's been a shift toward anthropology and collective memory and issues of subjectivity. And in short, these testimonials have now become memories, and that's how I've, how I've used them in the project. In other words, the oral evidence became increasingly seen as interpretations of lives, not as chronicles as lives. And that's how I use them, as interpretations uh, of lives. Some of the problems I encountered, some were both practical uh, and uh, methodological theoretical. I, was, I had to go through our internal review board, do voluminous paperwork. I had to write about a 15-page proposal. I had to turn in my I had to have each of my informants sign forms, both for granting me permission to interview them and then what I would do with the tapes afterward. I had these forms, you know, I translated these forms, had a native speaker tweak them, uh, and I didn't mention these forms until I actually met them to be interviewed, at which point I'd sort of sheepishly uh, whip them out and say, oh, we have a, you know, much of, lots of bureaucracy too, and guess what? Before I can begin, I need to ask you, really sorry about this. And you can appreciate why you know, not everyone was openly, immediately amenable to this. I had, I had to use my, tap my limited amount of charm uh, to get them to, to agree. Uh, there was also the technical side of things. Uh, back then, um, 
sort of traditional taping was still what most oral historians did, but there was the beginning of digitization, and there was a new cohort who were doing digital interviewing, and I wasn't sure what to do. I had to make a decision. So I went with the more traditional, because um, it just seemed safer, and there were more people who could help me with it. And by the way, I, I ordered this professional Marantz tape recorder, which arrived the morning I was leaving for Moscow. I couldn't figure out how to get it work. On the way to the airport, I stopped by the Oral History Center, and they <laughs> showed me how to use it. I wouldn't recommend this, but that's sometimes how our lives are. Of course, it was a problem finding my interviewees, whereas school officials in Saratov facilitated my project by allowing me to examine school records and by putting me in touch with several members of the graduating class. School administrators in Moscow were actually hostile. They did stress issues of confidentiality, and I think, legally speaking, they were right. Uh, but the bottom line is they weren't helpful, and it was really hard for me to find the Muscovites who are much more dispersed. But in time, I identified 83 1967 graduates and confirmed that six others had died. Uh, but given Moscow of, in Moscow, but given Moscow's size and the far-reaching um, dispersal of this cohort owing to immigration, I failed to locate 35 members of the Moscow class um, when I did the interviewing. It's also very expensive. Uh, I, I'm sort of torn by you know, encouraging people to work on oral history. If they're, if they're junior colleagues, the problem is you need to raise money to have the interviews transcribed in case you're going to do it yourself. And I hired native speakers to transcribe, um, transcribe the interviews. I also, you know, some of the more interesting methodological questions, how do I capture my interviewee's voice? How do the, not how things are said, the gestures, their intonations, their expressions, that is the nonverbal communication considerations. Uh, crudely put, the impression someone gives off. How do I convey that when I write about it? There are also cross-cultural issues here because I really didn't know, uh, I really didn't know um, much about really didn't know much about, uh, I mean, there weren't many studies available on cross-cultural interviewing among oral historians. It just wasn't widely done. And I think that uh, rem remembering has its own uh, special social and historical context. And in Russia, after all, it had been dangerous to remember. And please re keep that in mind. And I wondered often, did Soviet citizens really have two totally different biographies at hand, depending upon who was asking? I was sort of uh, intrigued by, what's, by what so sociolinguistics is, in sociolinguistics is called intersubjectivity of knowledge. That is, individuals assess social context and they say different things to different interlocutors. Uh, interviewees study the interviewer, in this case me, and they tell me what they believe that I want to know about them <laughs> and thereby reveal who they think I am. Uh, you know, in some, in some cases it was clear that you know, I was an American and they thought an American needed to know A, B, or C. Um, in other cases, I was Luba's friend. I was one of them. It was different and I could feel that difference. The timing of the interviews is also important. Um, I did most of them between 2002 and 2005. You know, at what time in the life cycle the story is told is, it, is as crucial uh, a factor in its shape. I was really interviewing people generously speaking, about two-thirds of the way through their, their life stories. And I also needed to avoid succumbing to uh, post-socialist stereotypes, such as you know, the West, transition, civil society, trying to understand them in these, in these sorts of terms. I, of course, uh, read the uh, Purton published work on the period, all the secondary literature and all the uh, uh, sociological literature in particular that had been generated, including some Soviet-era uh, public opinion surveys. But I privileged uh, the oral testimony in the book. Uh, in my case, this meant the three and a half thousand pages of transcribed, narrator-directed life story interviews. Another decision that shaped the book is that I decided to write a trade book, uh, a book for a, a wider audience, one not published by an academic press, uh, by a university press, so to speak, for the most part. Uh, and initially, uh, I, hadn't, I had planned to write an academic monograph. Um, uh, I emphasized earlier, I wanted to emphasize the interaction of interviewer and narrative with the goal of understanding meaning making. Um, but this changed once I decided to write this book for a, a wider audience. Um, I quote 
not for facts in the book, but for feelings, for understandings, uh, for judgments, taboos. I want to reveal what events meant uh, to people. Now, because the uh, individuals, uh, or individuals in general, uh, values and beliefs evolve uh, owing to personal experiences and changes within a, a much larger uh, socio-historical context, people do tell their stories in different ways throughout their lives. And my book, then, is not only about the specific historical events, but more so about what they meant to the baby boomers, to the members of the Cold War generation at the start of the new millennium. Above all, I sought to comprehend how the interviewees made sense of the world and the structure and patterns of Russian society as exhibited by these representative individuals, representative from the, the, this particular cohort of um, well-educated members of the urban intelligentsia. Constrain, both constrained uh, and enabled by the range of stories available in the given culture uh, at a given time, which people make their own, uh, life stories uh, tell us uh, not just about what people did, but what they wanted to do and what they believed they were doing and what they did. This is a quote from Alessandro Portelli, one of the great uh, oral historians whose works have been translated um, into English. Um, life stories reveal the canonical rules of a society at a certain time, um, its mores, behavioral expectations, and taboos. That said, the, uh, the highly intelligent, and I stress that, highly intelligent and well-educated people I interviewed, structured their uh, responses with a very high degree of integrative complexity. And I took that term looking at some interesting uh, literature generated in the medical field. Um, it's becoming practice in the subdiscipline of aging to conduct uh, uh, oral interviews um, with senior citizens. And based on the oral interviews to um, evaluate uh, uh, the person's um, um, uh, memory capacity, mental capacities, and things like, things like this. And in looking at the uh, data that's generated um, and the interviews themselves, the stories that my interviewees told, it's, it's very clear that they were in that, that top category of very, very complex integrative um, interviews. And not surprising, they were, indeed are very well educated and very, very sophisticated and smart. Uh, they felt comfortable in their own stories, which they already had available in draft form before I pried them open with questions, and we collaboratively co-authored the sources upon which my study is based. Uh, I confirmed, and I suspected, in my informants' responses, errors, certainly. I confirmed or uh, uh, suspected conscious silences, exaggerations, inventions, and it's sometimes even the co-opting of other people's stories. But I want to stress that memory is an interpretation of life rather than a chronicle of the past. Um, wrong statements, in other words, are nonetheless psychologically true, especially because people often act on the basis of how they understand life events rather than on the events themselves. So again, how we understand something might be more important than what really happened in terms of our own behavior. My project is not uh, dependent on the accurate memory of any one of my interviewees. I search for similarities, I search for differences, I search for contradictions among many people's narratives to discern patterns across a number of lives and therefore to get more than one side of the story. I used the oral evidence to uncover feelings, understandings, and judgments to reveal again, once again, what events meant to people. My interpretation, I arrived at it after filtering through an array of voices and juxtaposing text. I searched for the connection between biography and history since most people, for most people, they are invisible to themselves in the vast social transformations going on going on around them. Ultimately, I found that oral history was not all that different from the other kinds of history I had written. History composites, it creates a consecutive narrative out of the fragments, uh, 
And that's certainly what I did. Uh, as Raphael Samuel put it, a story is made, but history is found out. And that's what I saw my job to be. In other words, I selected their words in order to convey my own perspective. These decisions and selections are very typical of all the historical writing we do insofar as historians must always decide which sources to rely on in support of his or her th themes and interpretations. Uh, like any historical uh, editing of primary documents, I edited mine to focus on the things I considered important. In some, I constructed one narrative out of the fragments and one that I would argue is much more instructive than any single reality can be. I used the narratives to create a story that no one individual could tell, and I embedded my story in the much larger historical narratives of Cold War, de-Stalinization, overtaking America, opening up to the outside world, economic stagnation, dissent, emigration, the transition to a market economy, the transformation of class, ethnic, and gender relations, and globalization, among other things. Individual narratives add up to a collective subjectivity, and that's what I try to present in my book, uh, which is a collection of voices played in my own choral arrangement, as historian Kenneth Kahn put it, a book about uh, chicken farmers in America. Um, by the way, um, this is uh, Alexander uh, Konstantinov, the gold medalist from the Saratov group who spent his entire career at Moscow University where he teaches. And um, in, during the interview process, he mentioned that he had been, um, until he started school, that they had a village nanny from Rizan Oblast, uh, where the family was from. The nanny um, took care of him. He hadn't, he, he hadn't seen her since he was uh, nine, ten years old. Uh, the interviewing got him so interested in this that he actually went to Rizan and found her in the village. So this was his village nanny, and he sent me, sent me the picture. I wanted to share that with you. A few remarks about some of my findings. Um, my arrangement uh, underscores the revolutionary impact of decades of peaceful evolutionary organic development uh, in, in effect, transforming the Soviet Union out of existence. In changing it from a state that mobilized society to accomplish ambitious goals into a modern, highly literate urban society that lost its coherence as the Stalinist econ economic model began to exhaust its potential and began to exhaust the Soviet dream. Uh, an economic of scarcity under Stalin had made uh, the new Soviet man, Homo Sovieticus, a peculiar kind of consumer, and the rise of modern consumerism after World War II made him now a consumer with expectations, expectations that the system did not meet. While the Cold War generation grew up, uh, systemic problems and the measured opening up to the outside world promoted private over collective values, and this in turn exacerbated the troubles that increasingly made reform the order of the day. Deficits in what I call the Soviet myth economy, that is the, the myths that hold society together, uh, aggravated the economic shortages. The Soviet Cold War generation grew up believing in it lived in the best country in the world. That was pounded into their heads in school. Don't forget Khrushchev's party program, um, surpassing the United States by 1970, achieving communism by 1980. But this perception came under assault when, it reached, when they reached adulthood and sought to find their own niche uh, within that society. My arrangement of voices also highlights the baby boomers' uh, agency in participating in and constructing uh, a new society and their own lives. Shaped fundamentally by their families, uh, they lived remarkably normal lives in a society uh, that Stephen Hansen said was quickly losing its uniqueness. I like that, was quickly using its uniqueness. Their lives align fully with the social uh, uh, rules and norms of Soviet society that ironically included forces that eventually subverted the system. I mentioned last night that what was Soviet about the Soviet dream, it wasn't the specific things people wanted. 
what they wanted weren't very far from what we wanted in the American dream, but how they went about achieving these things, that's what made it Soviet. Many, uh, most baby boomers, uh, like the CIA and uh, Western academics, did not expect the disintegration of the USSR, but as anthropologist uh, Alexei Yurchak argued, they were ready for the collapse when it came, finding it logical and in some ways even inevitable. Now, although the baby boomers routinely violated and reinterpreted the norms of expected behavior, many of them supported the values and ideals of Soviet socialism until they publicly came under fire uh, when Gorbachev came to power. That said, others, and a good number of others, <coughs> sensed that the system was doomed and even wanted out. In other words, what concrete experiences compelled one in six of the baby boomers I interviewed to immigrate to the United States, Canada, Western Europe, or Israel? And by the way, at least 13 others did as well, people who many of whom I contacted, but they refused to let me interview them. Um, most left Russia after the fall of the USSR, had made it possible to do so, but they had entertained the possibility long before. This was not a new idea for them. With the benefit of hindsight, the most important and transformative historical events, such as the end of the Cold War and demise of the Soviet Union, seem inevitable. But there is often little agreement over what caused these events, over what they mean. The baby boomers' personal recollections are framed by a much broader collective, by much broader collective memory, uh, by widely shared counts of events. Collective memory is a form of mediated action between people and the cultural tools available to them, in particular narrative texts or stories, uh, and it belongs to a specific uh, time and place in history. It often reflects a, spe a special social, uh, a social position and perspective. And of course, it's constantly undergoing change. These observations are crucial to the story presented in my book because owing to the new information made available to the baby boomers when Gorbachev was in power uh, and he launched Perestroika, the differences between uh, living in Moscow and Saratov um, in regard to how that shaped people's uh, memories and lived experiences had lost its significance. Gorbachev's most successful reform, glasnost or openness, which ironically doomed the others, now leveled the playing field. Everyone in the Soviet Union who wished to now had access more or less to the same flood of revelatory and even dubious information. Pitestroika and glasnost, in other words, contributed to a, break drown, a, bake, uh, uh, a breakdown of the ideals of the socialist experiment and an uncritical interest, as all of us know who visited at the time, an uncritical interest in Western models and often outmoded imperial Russian forms. But the result, the result is considerable, not universal, but considerable homogeneity in the baby boomers' assessment of the Soviet experiment, which reveals once again a social position of members of the uh, upper stratum of the urban intelligentsia and the perspective, that of the well-educated urban professional class. Despite the wrenching uh, difficulties and the nostalgia for elements of the past that many baby boomers endured uh, as we entered the new millennium during this really bumpy transition in the 1990s, the vast majority of those I interviewed remembered many, uh, but not all, features of the Soviet system negatively and looked upon the post-Soviet period very positively, in spite of real concerns they had over specific policies and developments. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to, to uh, answer any questions you might have.